All right, guys, welcome to part three in our Galatians Bible study. Now, as you know, this ministry is all about defending the biblical roots of Christianity from false teachings like Torahism. So this is an apologetics Bible study, and we're approaching the book of Galatians with an eye for the theological themes that speak to the relationship between the Christian and the law of Moses. And today we're going to step into the Apostle Paul's classroom as he puts on a masterclass in biblical theology, starting in chapter 3. So let's do a quick recap of where we are. So Galatians is a passionate letter that Paul wrote to the churches that he had planted in Galatia that were, following, that were falling under the influence of false teachers. These were Judaizers who were teaching that Christians are required to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses, which is something Paul refers to in chapter 1 as a false gospel. And we discovered that the other apostles agreed with Paul because when they all met up in Jerusalem, they didn't require Titus, a Greek believer, to be circumcised. And then in chapter 2, Paul confronted Peter about the fact that he used to eat with the Gentiles until these false teachers showed up, and then Peter separated from the Gentiles. And Paul called him to the carpet on that because that sort of conduct was, quote, not in step with the truth of the gospel. And so Paul launches into what is essentially a sermon on how we're not justified by works of the law. And our last episode left off at the final verse of chapter 2, which is a sort of mic drop moment where Paul says, If righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Well, okay, I guess it wasn't actually a mic drop moment because as we're about to see, Paul was just getting started on this sermon, which continues into chapter 3. And that's where we'll pick up today. As you know, the chapters and verse numbers aren't part of the original writings. They were added later by Bible translators to help us keep things organized. So let's begin today by rereading the last verse of chapter 2 and then moving right into chapter 3. And for those of you following along at home, we're reading from the ESV. So... Paul's in the middle of a lecture on how we're justified by faith and not by works of the law. And let's read through a chunk of text here and then go back and unpack it. So starting at chapter 2, verse 21. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Christ, Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law? or by hearing with faith, just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Whoa, Paul is worked up. And here we see one of his favorite teaching devices in spades, the rhetorical question. So Paul's trying to get the believers in Galatia to snap out of a spell, right? To, to shake off these bewitching teachings. And he's continuing here with the contrast that he, that he introduced in the previous chapter between works of the law and faith in Jesus. We looked at that last time, and Paul's just going to keep beating the same drum here in chapter 3. He's really drawing out the differences between works of the law and human effort on one hand, and faith in Jesus on the other. So let's take a closer look at this passage. So verse 1, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Now, this letter was written roughly 20 years after Yeshua's crucifixion, and it's unlikely that any of these believers in Galatia actually witnessed that event. Now remember, these are churches that Paul had planted much later and to whom he had taught the gospel, as he tells us in chapter 1. So here he's reminding them of that, saying, Look, I set before you the sacrifice of Jesus, and that needs to remain your focus. And then he asks a rhetorical question, verse 2. Let me, ask you, let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? 
And there's that contrast again, law and faith. Paul's trying to bring their minds back to when they first came to faith. And he's asking them to remember, how did your new life in Christ begin? Did the, did the Holy Spirit fall on you because of your tireless efforts to eat kosher and keep the feasts and all the rest? Or was it because you responded in faith to the preaching of the gospel? And Paul's answer, of course, is that they received the Spirit, that they came to salvation through their faith. And the phrase, are you so foolish, would have stung here. Paul's challenging their intelligence. He's saying, how could you possibly think that what God began in you through his Holy Spirit, that you can somehow maintain that on your own? This is exactly what some Hebrew roots teachers say today. They say, sure, salvation doesn't come through the law, but once we're saved, keeping the law is how we maintain our salvation. <laughs> oh, foolish Torahists. Now, there are a couple of important theological ideas to notice here in verses 2 and 3. First, you should know that Paul mentions the Holy Spirit 18 times in this letter. It plays a crucial role in his defense of the gospel through the grace of God. And he'll write later in many of his other epistles, like Romans, about how the presence of the Holy Spirit in a believer's life is evidence of a true conversion. There's no salvation without the work of the Holy Spirit. And Paul directly links the presence of the Holy Spirit with a genuine faith in Jesus. And that's what he's re reminding the believers in Galatia of here. And I think it's important for us to just be aware of these kind of word groups that Paul's using as he draws out this contrast. On one side, Paul refers to the works of the law, works of the flesh, or sometimes just the flesh, meaning our human physical efforts. And on the other side, we have faith and the Spirit. So this contrast that, that Paul's highlighting also has an aspect of natural versus supernatural. Which brings us to the second theological idea I want to point out here in verse 3. It's this phrase, perfected by the flesh. So, so Paul uses three Greek terms in this argument to refer to the same general concept. There's DKO, which means justified, and then there's a closely related word is Dikaiosuni, which means righteousness. And then there's epitaleo, which means completed or finished, or as the ESV renders it, perfected. So in our English translations, these are the words justified, righteousness, and perfected. And these are all closely related in the argument that Paul's putting together here. They all refer to the idea of being declared righteous or being right in the, in the eyes of God. So here in verse 3, when Paul asks, Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? He's saying, are you now trying to complete your righteousness by your own works, your, your physical efforts at keeping the law? And then he asks another question, which is a little more obscure and maybe personal. Verse 4, Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? So Paul and his readers would have understood what things he was referring to. But it's a little ambiguous for us today. I mean, he could be talking about a painful learning process or maybe the difficult spiritual experiences. Maybe that's what they suffered. Or, or maybe it's some sort of social ostracism that they were experiencing because of their faith in Jesus. And then the questions just keep coming. Verse 5, Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? So, who is Paul talking about here? Who supplies the Spirit to the believers in Galatia? And by whose power are miracles being done? He's talking about God, of course, and he's asking, does God do these things? D does he pour out his Spirit and work miracles because of your works of the law or because of your faith? It's another rhetorical question with an obvious answer that Paul then ties to Abraham in the next verse. So. Verses 5 and 6, which are one thought. Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, in other words, does God do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith, just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness? And this is Paul's first mention of Abraham, the father of the faith in this epistle. And he's pointing out that Abraham was counted as righteous based on his faith, not his works. In fact, 
as Paul's going to point out a little later in this chapter, the law wasn't even given until more than 400 years after Abraham lived. So Abraham never kept a single law of Moses, and yet God counted him as righteous. And with that, Paul's now going to take his readers on a fascinating historical and theological journey, grounding his argument about works versus faith in the Torah itself. So to make sure we're tracking with Paul's argument here, let's flip back to the book of Genesis, chapter 15. And this is where God made his covenant with Abraham. And Paul's going to refer to this a number of times in the coming verses in Galatians. So let's refresh ourselves on what it says. And remember, in their very old age, the Lord had promised Abraham and Sarah a son. But they grew impatient waiting on God, so they just took matters into their own hands. And Abraham ended up having a son, Ishmael, through his servant Hagar, rather than his elderly wife, Sarah. And Genesis 15 is where God tells Abraham that, even though he was his firstborn son, Ishmael wouldn't be his heir, that Abraham would have a natural son. And then verse 5, And God brought Abraham outside and said, Look toward the heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. So God made a promise to Abraham that his offspring would be like the number of stars in the sky at night. But those offspring wouldn't come through Ishmael, who was, and here's the key, who was a product of the work of Abraham's flesh. Abraham took matters into his own hands, and God said, no, Abraham's true heir is going to come through the son that God had promised to give him. And as you know, Sarah ultimately gave birth to that promised son when she was 91 years old, and they named him Isaac. So there's a son of the flesh, the works, right? Abraham had Ishmael as a result of his own will and physical efforts. And then there's a son of the promise, a son that came through God's promise, through God's will. And in Genesis 12, 3, God promises Abraham that in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So not just his own family or his own descendants, but all families will be blessed through Abraham. And when you read the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew 1, you see that Jesus descended from Abraham through the promised son Isaac. So Jesus is the blessing that came through Abraham and is for all the families of the earth. Okay, so keep in mind these promises to Abraham so, so let's jump back to Galatians 3. Now, Paul tells the Galatians that God has supplied the Spirit to you and works miracles among you because of your faith. And then verse 6, Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness, know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. So now we can see Paul's allusion to Abraham's two sons in the text. Ishmael, who was the result of, of Abraham's work in the flesh, and Isaac, who was a, a result of Abraham's faith. And it's those of faith, not works, who God considers the sons or the descendants of Abraham. And again, it was Abraham's son by faith, Isaac, through whom Jesus came. So Paul's tying Abraham's faith directly to faith in Jesus. And he does so explicitly in the next verse. Verse 8. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. This is so amazing. I love this. Paul connects Abraham and his faith to Jesus so completely that he actually says that the gospel was preached to Abraham. Well, this brings to mind the words of Jesus in uh, John 8, 56, where he says, Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So, so Paul's drawing this connecting line of faith, starting at Abraham and extending all the way th down through the centuries to Jesus, and then by extension to everyone who places their faith in Jesus. Verse 9, So then those who are of faith in Jesus are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. So Jesus is the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham in Genesis 12, 3, that in him, all the families of the earth will be blessed. 
right? The families of the earth weren't blessed through Ishmael, the son of works. God's promise to Abraham was fulfilled through Isaac, the son of faith, which is why Jesus says in John 4 that salvation is from the Jews. So if you're a Christian today and you place your faith in Jesus, then you are an, you're an inheritor, a living heir of the promise that Yahweh made to Abraham 4,000 years ago. Wow. Okay, with the foundation of that connection to Abraham established, Paul's gonna start connecting some other dots and, and stringing some pearls together as his argument unfolds here. So again, he's just established that those who live by faith are blessed along with Abraham who lived by faith. And then here comes the contrast to that verse. Verse 10, For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. So unlike those who live by faith, those who try to live by their own effort to make themselves righteous through works of the law or works of the flesh are cursed. And Paul backs that up with a quote from the Torah. He's citing Deuteronomy 27, 26 here to show that everyone who relies on works of the law is under the curse of the law. And he's showing his readers that this isn't a new idea. It comes from the Torah itself. And he's contrasting that with the blessing of Abraham that's given to all who trust God, including Gentiles. As he mentioned specifically in verse 8, in other words, contrary to what the Judaizers were teaching, the law can't justify or save anyone. Why? Because the breaking of any command of the law brought a curse on the person who broke it. So Deuteronomy 11 says, verse 26, See, I am setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing, if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today. And the curse, if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside from the way that I am commanding you today to go after other gods that you have not known. So the commandments this verse is talking about are the law that God gave to Israel through Moses. It's what scripture calls the law of Moses. And the law of Moses served as the terms of the, of the covenant that God made with Israel at Mount Sinai. And that covenant came with blessings and curses, which are, which are spelled out in detail in Deuteronomy 28. So Paul's reminding the Galatians about what the Torah says, that those who live under the law had a literal curse hanging over their heads. Yahweh set before them a blessing, of course, but also a curse if they didn't obey. So they were always aware that if they didn't keep the commandments, there were curses that would follow. And the Old Testament records Israel's continuous inability to keep that law, to, to keep that covenant. In fact, it was because Israel continually broke the covenant, they just could not keep the law, that Yahweh decided in His mercy to make a new covenant with His people. So 600 years before Jesus, the prophet Jeremiah wrote, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. And catch this, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. So God is the faithful husband and Israel was an unfaithful bride. And guess what? Christians today are no better than Israel. No one can keep the law perfectly. We're all cursed. As Paul says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So here in Galatians, Paul is showing how all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. And he continues, verse 11, now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law for the righteous shall live by faith. So there again is Paul's common refrain in this book, no one is justified before God by the law. And he quotes from Habakkuk 2.4, the righteous shall live by faith, which of course also brings to mind Genesis 15, which we just looked at, where Abraham's faith made him righteous. And the subtext here is that, hey, these aren't new ideas, guys. This is all stuff that comes from our own Hebrew scriptures. 
And Paul is really going to draw out that distinction between faith and law. Verse 12, but the law is not of faith. Wow, don't miss that. The law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. <laughs> Look at that, another quote from the Torah. And here he's citing Leviticus 18.5 to draw a stark contrast. The law is not of faith. They aren't the same thing. Why? Well, because the law is based on doing. Leviticus says that the one who does these commandments shall live by them. But faith, on the other hand, is based on believing and trusting. Now, sometimes Hebrew roots teachers will try to take this nuanced approach and claim, hey, it takes faith to obey the law. So they'll conclude that faith is obedience to the law. <laughs> but Paul blows that idea out of the water here. He quotes Leviticus to show that God requires the doing of the law, not merely believing in it. And therein lies the rub. Since no one can keep or do the law perfectly, we're all cursed. And for our Hebrew roots friends who tend to marginalize or even reject Paul and claim that his teachings clash with what Jesus taught, think about this. How many times do we read about Jesus saying something like, your faith has made you well? We find that at least a dozen times in the Gospels, but we never hear him saying, your keeping of the law has made you well. For example, Matthew 9, when the woman who had been bleeding for 12 years touched the fringe of his garment, does Jesus turn around and say, take heart, daughter, your works have made you well? No. Even though she worked pretty hard to get through the crowd and touch him, he said, your faith has made you well. Or in Luke 22, when Jesus foretells Peter's denial, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that you do not fail in your works of the law. <laughs> no, that's not what it says. Jesus says, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. Jesus doesn't, doesn't tell us that if our works are the size of a mustard seed, we can move a mountain. <laughs> and he never says, oh, you of little works. <laughs> no, for Jesus, just like for Paul, it's all about faith. Okay, you get the point. So continuing on here in Galatians 3, uh, verse 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree so that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Wow, there's a lot packed into these two verses. So let's dig in a little here. First, would you look at that? It's yet another quote from the Torah. In the span of seven verses here, Paul has quoted from the Hebrew Bible six times. And in this case, he's quoting Deuteronomy 21, 23. And what's really interesting is that Paul seems to be using a Hebrew method of interpretation here called Midrash. Now, Midrash is an approach where you examine the text from all sides and, and derive interpretations from it that aren't immediately obvious. So you're looking for something beneath the primary meaning of the text. And then you, then you apply that deeper or other meaning to something else. So the original meaning in this passage from Deuteronomy 21 is that, hey, if a guy commits a capital crime, punishable by death, and you hang him on a tree, you can't leave his body there because, as it says in verse 23, a hanged man is cursed by God. But Paul takes this concept of a man hanging on a tree and applies it to the crucifixion of Jesus. And by doing that, he's making this profound point. He's showing his readers how under the law of Moses, it was the Israelites who were under a curse. Because again, if they didn't keep those commandments, they would break the covenant and suffer the curses that God set out. So in a very real sense, they were living under a curse. And so Paul's talking about the fact that technically speaking, it was those who couldn't keep the law, which includes literally everybody, those who could not keep the law are the ones who should have been placed on that cross. They should have suffered the curse of the law. But in a mind-blowing act of mercy, verse 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. This is the idea that theologians have come to refer to as substitutionary or vicarious atonement. 
Paul is teaching that Jesus Christ took the full punishment that we deserved for our sins as a substitute in our place. That's the gospel right there. As my pastor Tony says, the gospel in four words, Jesus in my place. That's what it's all about. For Paul, the gospel is the central message that he's always hammering home. And so the profound point he's making is this. Under the law of Moses, the Israelites were under a curse, and God was not. But Jesus reversed those roles. God willingly placed himself under a curse in order to free his people from their curse. All right, so from here, Paul is only going to be wading into deeper waters. And so rather than continuing on, I want to take a moment to sort of recap all that Paul's been teaching us since the, the middle of chapter 2. Because there are some important themes and patterns here that we need to notice that are going to help us as we continue to work our way through the, the rest of this book. Now, hopefully by now you're getting the message that Paul's practically shouting to his readers. I mean, how many times in the last few verses has he talked about the law not making us right with God? I mean, going all the way back to chapter 2, this has been Paul's repeated message over and over. So check it out. Chapter 2, verse 16. A person is not justified by works of the law. Not by works of the law. By works of the law, no one will be justified. <laughs> and that's just verse 16. Uh, and then in verse 21. If righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. And then in chapter 3, verse 2, did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Verse 3, are you now being perfected by the flesh? By which he means the, the doing of the law. Uh, verse 5, does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by the, the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Uh, verse 10, all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. Verse 11, no one is justified before God by the law. <laughs> Verse 12, but the law is not of faith. So I don't know about you, but I'm starting to sense a theme here. No one is made right with God by the keeping of the law of Moses. And there's another theme running through that same passage of text that Paul stresses just as strongly. Again, going back to chapter 2, verse 16, let's look at all his comments about faith. A person is justified through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Jesus Christ in order to be justified by faith in Christ. Uh, verse 20, I live by faith in the Son of God. Uh, moving to chapter 3, verse 7, it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. Verse 9, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham. Uh, verse 11, the righteous shall live by faith. Verse 14, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. <laughs> so the Apostle Paul is a lot of things. But in this book, <laughs> subtle is not one of them. He's really hammering this point home. And he's only going to ramp up his efforts in the, in the coming verses. And let's not lose sight of the context here. So what sent Paul off on this sermon about the law and faith in the first place? Why did he launch into this long theological discourse? Well, he's responding to and correcting the false teachings of the Judaizers. He's trying to correct these foolish Galatians who have fallen under a spell. He's saying, come on, guys, you know this stuff. Don't let those false teachers deceive you. You're not required to keep the law of Moses. It's not what makes you right with God. It's your faith. It's always been your faith. And that's my message today to my Hebrew Roots friends. Come on, guys. You know this. Keeping the law doesn't make us right with God. I mean, if you want to celebrate the feasts or keep a kosher diet or observe the Saturday Sabbath, go for it. But check your motivations. Are you doing these things out of the freedom that Christ has given you? And by the way, that concept of freedom is something that Paul really unpacks throughout this book, book as well. We saw it in, in chapter 2 when he talked about the Judaizers, who he called false brothers, who were spying out our freedom. And then he's going to touch on it again at the end of chapter 3 here. 
and in chapter four and, and in chapter five, of course. So yeah, if you're keeping those mosaic traditions from within your freedom to worship God in your own way, well then that's beautiful. But, and listen closely, if there's some part of you that thinks that, that keeping those things will please God or that it will make you right with Him, or, or, or if you think that it adds to your holiness or that it's how a righteous person should live or that it makes you a good and obedient believer, I mean, if any of those things are part of your motivation for keeping the Mosaic rituals, I'm sorry, but you're wasting your time and you're insulting Jesus. Paul couldn't be any clearer here. By works of the law, no one will be justified. If righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. And here's one last amazing thing that I think we can take away from the first half of chapter three. And it's something that Paul's gonna paint in a lot more detail in the, in the second half of this chapter, which we'll look at next time. But the promise that God gave to Abraham that in him all the families of the earth would be blessed is obviously a promise that was intended for Gentiles as well. It wasn't just for Abraham's family, not just for the Israelites or the Jewish people, it was for all the families of the earth, for Jews and Gentiles. And by contrast though, the law of Moses with its blessings and curses was only given to the nation of Israel. That's who God made the Sinai covenant with. It wasn't with the whole world or, or all the nations, it was with Israel alone. And as Paul's gonna explain in the second half of this chapter, the law of Moses was always intended as a temporary guide for God's people, <laughs> to which I know that my Hebrew roots friends are probably throwing things at the screen right now <laughs> as they watch this. But let's hear Paul out on this. In our next episode, we're gonna get into that whole idea about the law of Moses serving a temporary purpose in God's overarching plan for his people. Because again, from the very beginning, his intention was to bless the whole world through Jesus. Thanks for watching. I hope you're enjoying this journey through Galatians as much as I am. We'll see you on the next one. Shalom.